Hey everybody, how's it going? I need to turn the notifications off on of my watch or I'll just annoy everybody. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm glad that you got to see the, the nice changeover of the laptops. It's sort of a ritual. Uh, it's really nice. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Node, uh, how Node is doing, how it's spread, and how we've uh, come to think about Node at the Node Foundation as we've tried to broaden our view of what's going on. Um, so Node, objectively, by any criteria right now, is the fastest growing platform in open source in the world. So uh, we're not the biggest yet, but we are definitely growing faster than anybody else by any measure. Uh, which means that eventually we actually will be the largest uh, platform in the world. Uh, c what does that mean? Um, there's a couple different metrics that you can look at. This is module counts. Uh, obviously, we have an amazing packaging system and a lot of great modules. Ashley hates this. Um, oh, and also it's old, so Ashley is just like, like, oh man, no, we're way above 3,000, 3,000 now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is like, you know, and NPM is not happy with my slide. I'm sorry, uh, but. <laughs> But we, we are over twice as large as the next ecosystem down in terms of package count. Um, and the more impressive thing, actually, is that if you, if you don't look at a graph like this, that's an absolute number. But if you look at um, growth in terms of percentage growth, quarter over quarter, or year over year, we're still growing faster than actually every other ecosystem in the world as well. Um, so our lead is continuing to increase over everybody by any measure in terms of, in terms of uh, open source packaging. Is my thingy not working? There we go. Okay, uh, so this is probably old too, and Ashley will give me some shit about it in a second. Uh, but more than 400 packages are published every day. Uh, that's not updates to packages. That's new packages arrive in the ecosystem every day. Um, and this is really important for people that like don't want to write all of their code from scratch. Uh, people that just want to solve problems with technology. Which turns out to be the majority of people that want to write code, or people that want to solve a problem. They don't want to build out an entire new framework and an entire new library. So the, the larger and, and more cohesive ecosystem that we have, the better. Um, Node has around 4.5 million users now. That's estimated. We, we have a really complex model that we shove a lot of numbers into to try to figure this out. Um, but the important thing is that we're, we're consistently growing at 100% year over year, which means that we double every year. We've doubled every year for four years, and that rate isn't slowing down. There's, there's no signs of it starting to level out anytime soon. Um, which means that you know, in a little over a year than, from now, we'll be over 10 million users. Um, and you know, in a couple years, that would make us the number one platform in the world. Uh, it'll make us larger than Java and .NET, uh, who are really the only people <laughs> that we're competing with at this point. So why is Node growing like this? Um, when we started the foundation, we, we really wanted to broaden the view of what Node was and why it was successful. Um, up until that point, we'd really thought about Node as a back-end technology. Um, you know, the people that, that had funded Node and had led the effort were mostly back-end people. Um, and so we, we kind of had a bit of a blind spot to what was going on outside of back-end technologies in Node. Um, and after we started the foundation and really started to break down, why is Node successful? Why is it growing so much faster? Um, we initially had put things into buckets. We, we looked at verticals, right? So you have mobile, you, you have people doing IoT stuff, people doing backend, and that actually didn't seem to tell the right story to us because um, it was really the, the fusion of all these things together. Um, so, so what we found was that if you look at what you need to do if you want to build a modern application, right? You want to solve a problem, you want to build a new application. What is the world that a developer has to contend with, okay? So you have a web front end, because people still use websites, um, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, I mean, obviously you have a cloud backend, like everybody has a backend, and, and you know, what that backend looks like and what the API is is changing over time. Um, you have mobile and tablets and various responsive designs and, and outputs that you need to worry about. Um, you've got desktop, like, I mean, Desktop is still a thing. Some people still use desktop applications. Like, I still use Slack on my desktop, uh, and I still use a desktop text editor. It's a thing. People use it. Uh, <laughs> you have this entire new class of API services that you're connecting to, right? So it's not just my own backend with all my own infrastructure, but it's also other people's infrastructure, other people's APIs that I'm trying to connect to. Um, and in case this wasn't complicated enough for everybody, you have IoT devices. So you have this, this whole other platform where the interface is different, where all of the 
the patterns are different, right? And so if you need to build an application that stretches like even half of these things, much less all of them, um, you really need some kind of connective tissue that allows you to, as a developer, have a unified development environment, have a unified debug environment, at least to the best of your ability. And there's really no credible story other than Node to actually tie all these things together. There are a lot of other platforms, a lot of other languages that might do any one of these verticals better, I mean objectively better, but if you need to use all of them together, there's really no other competitor. Um, so so let's, let's talk about some of those, like, you know, specifically. So, <laughs> Web front-end development kind of caught us off guard. Um, in the first node conf that I ever ran, we had a panel, and it had like Ryan Dahl and, and Paul Querna and me and, and Isaac Schluter and Brennan Ike. And we asked, uh, what should you not use node for? Right? Like, what are the things that people shouldn't do in Node? Uh, and there were two unanimous answers. One was you shouldn't do shell scripty things or like scripty stuff that has like outputs. Like, you should do that in Bash or whatever. Um, and, <laughs> and like, that turned out to be one of the largest things that anybody ever did with Node, actually. Um, having a unified language for front end tooling ended up being more important than uh, the you know, annoyance of doing uh, callback for, for things that are essentially just piped together. Um, so, we, we have all these great tools now for uh, compiling like front-end JavaScript, right? We have these lower-level tools like, like Babel and ESLint and Last, and then we had so many tools that we like started inventing tools that, oh, I'm falling off the stage, that was fun. Um, <laughs> All right, let's start that again. All right, there we go. Uh, so we had so many tools and we literally wrote tools to manage the tools. So we have like tools to manage our tool chains, um, which is kind of absurd to me. Uh, and then, you know, I don't put NPM scripts in here because I'm not trying to troll anybody. And then, um, and then React is something that really caught me off guard and I think caught a lot of people off guard. In, in, <laughs> in that, um, React is a front-end framework, right? It, it, it's, it's, well, okay, yeah, yeah, Ashley's gonna disagree with me because she's from NPM, she's gotta represent. Um, but Re React is a front-end framework. It, it's, it's comparable to, say, like, you know, the, the first version of Angular or Dojo or frameworks that we're used to thinking about on the front-end, but it's actually the first framework that is not a script include before a bunch of your client JavaScript in the browser. It's actually implemented as a compile chain rather than anything else, which is somewhat unique. And, and I think it's kind of a, a one directional shift in front end frameworks, where now we're actually not gonna have a lot of front end frameworks that we just include, script includes, because there's so much more power to be had as we've seen with React. Um, and I think that that's just really just the beginning, regardless of what you think of React. Um, so obviously Node has kind of changed the way that we do web front ends. Uh, let, let's, let's look at something else. Let's look at mobile development. Um, so Apache Cordova basically takes the entire Node ecosystem and leverages it into a tool chain that can allow you to write basically native web applications, <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, for mobile. And um, it, it, I think it was uh, something like 60% of the top 100 applications in the Android and iOS stores are, are built on, the, on this technology. Uh, you don't actually know when you're in a web view a lot of the time on mobile. A lot of really, really popular applications without anybody knowing it are actually built on Cordova. Um, and, and that's because being able to leverage the Node ecosystem, being able to leverage web technologies, just has a lot of advantages if you're trying to build a cross-platform ap application. There's really nothing but the web that's ever been successful at doing cross-platform. Um, so let's, let's move on again, uh, and I think now we're gonna talk about desktop, yeah. So um, never thought this would happen. Um, it turns out that desktop application, I mean, I've known that desktop applications are popular for a long time. If you worked at any bigger company, you know that like your usage of desktop applications is absurdly high, and you're like, who are these people that still use a desktop application? And then you look at your desktop, and you have like 20 applications open, and you're like, I guess I'm the person. Um, but <laughs> uh, Electron was built by GitHub uh, in order to, to build the Atom Editor, right? So it's, it's just a, it's, it's honestly the most enjoyable development environment in the whole world. Because like the annoying things about web development are like cross-platform issues and like, you know, security issues. So like let's just like throw out the security model and just only have one version of Chrome that you ever have to write to. And also just like require node modules, that's Electron. It's brilliant, I love it, it's my favorite thing. Um, but it, it's, it, it essentially just like brings the entire Node ecosystem and all of those web technologies to every major desktop platform. And a lot of applications that you're using today are built in this. Like it is, 
insanely surprising, actually, how many applications have been built in such a short amount of time. I mean, the Slack desktop application that I use every day is built in this. Not only at the Atom Editor, but Microsoft's Visual Studio Code Editor is built on Electron. Like, I did not think 10 years ago that I would say Microsoft's new Visual Studio is built on web technologies and, and you know, an open source JavaScript framework. That would be crazy. Um, but it, it's, it's happened. Um, and and if, you, if you really don't feel like this has come full circle yet, like, the Brave browser is built on Electron. Like, we, we took the language from the web and built Node on it, and then Brave went and built a browser on top of Node. It's, it's awesome. Um, so, so a lot of great things are happening. Re I, I really encourage everybody to check this out. It's, like, it's actually more fun and kind of easier than regular web development, um, surprisingly. It's a great way to just like, try out Node and try out ideas. Uh, super fun. But this is really changing desktop development, too. Like, every day, new applications that I'm running get replaced by Electron applications. I just got rid of iTerm, actually, for Hyperterm, which is this new terminal editor built by uh, Guillermo Rauch, who built uh, Socket.io. And it's an Electron-based terminal because, hey, now I can customize customize my terminal in, with Node. Like, it's, it's amazing. Um, all right, let's move on to, to the cloud, because uh, we haven't had enough buzzwords yet. So cloud, cloud, big data, China market. Um, so <laughs> um, obviously, Node is very like, powerful in, in backends. We've been successful in backend for a very, very long time. Um, there is not a cloud platform where Node is not one of the primary supported environments, right? So you're never a second-class citizen running Node on anybody's public cloud. Um, but, you know, even further than that, uh, we'll get into that later. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk a little bit about IoT. So from very early on, um, Node had a great robotics community. It, like, hands up if you're involved in the NodeBots community at all, or have any experience in the NodeBots community, hands up. Just a couple people, really. It's, it is honestly, like, the most fun community in, in ever. Like, they're super nice, super fun, doing really, really cool stuff. Um, so there's been a hobbyist community for at least, like, six years just doing Node robotics stuff. Um, and this framework that, that's kind of sitting below all, a lot of it, uh, Johnny Five, is written by somebody who worked on jQuery. And so there's a, a really, like, there's a really ease of use there that feels very jQuery-ish in how simple it makes programming IoT and programming robotics. Um, but in the last year, something has kind of shifted, where we used to be talking to these devices through like a host environment, like your computer is running Node and then it's talking to this device. And the ecosystem and the developer tools around doing that got so good that the underlying IoT device manufacturers started saying, hey, this Node thing is like a thing. Uh, and they like get evented programming, which is like what IoT is, uh, so maybe we should support that natively. And so now, um, all Raspberry Pis, the Intel Galileo and Edison, so the low power and high power, the Tessel 2, the Beagle Bone, um, everybody is running Node on device. So, like th these chipsets, you know, today they are for developers to go out and build new IoT devices, but in a couple of years, the cost of these come down so that they end up in your light switches and they end up in, in all of the little IoT devices that you have in your house. So this means that the entire Node platform will be accessible um, to developers on those devices, right? And so this solves a lot of the issues, like if, you, if you're really heavily involved in the IoT world right now, one of the problems is a, a complete lack of standardization around APIs or data or, or anything. Um, and the fact that now if you implement a protocol or implement some idea in the Node ecosystem, you can actually get it on all these devices, is going to be really empowering. And, and I think that this is really going to kind of shift some of the, the way in which we're trying to develop IoT in the future. Um, so last one here is APIs. A oh, APIs and microservices, because more buzzwords, because we need them. Uh, so <laughs> APIs are on the rise. Like we, we, we know that. Uh, the way that developers consume infrastructure has changed. They consume it like a product. They consume it like an API, rather than a, hey, here's a hunk of technology on our cloud. Figure it out. Um, you know, everything is getting more amateurized. And so we have this rise of APIs that are happening. Obviously, a lot of this is fueled by Node. Node is accessible, like, like very good at uh, marshalling between a lot of different APIs if your application is doing that. But then recently, we have this new suite 
of serverless technologies, right? So first it was Lambda, and then everybody had to do one, so everybody did one. Um, and in all of these, Node is, is not only you know, well-supported and upfront, but in some of them is the only available language for these serverless technologies. And so part of this is that um, in this new landscape where you're not, you don't even know how many of your processes are running and they're just coming up and coming down really quickly, you need a really fast start time, and you need to be incredibly efficient at the process level. The history of Node is, is somewhat interesting, but we've always had a huge focus on being very, very fast and very efficient. Ryan used to say back in 2009 that uh, performance is a feature. It's a core feature of Node. Um, because we've always focused on non-blocking I.O., that meant being efficient in, in a in a single process environment. And we got a lot of shit from people, uh, especially in the Java world, about like how we weren't you know, scaling out to multiple you know, processors and da-da-da. As this world is built out and as the microservice world is built out, the addressable space for your application has actually gotten smaller. It's now a, a slice of one process inside of a container inside of a VM somewhere. Right? And in that environment, all of this work that we've done for years to be really efficient per process has really paid off. And so we're a natural fit for these new serverless and, and microservice technologies. Um, so when you put all this together, it's, it, no one of these is why Node is successful. It's actually all of them together, right? Like when, when people adopt Node in IoT, that drives cloud adoption. <laughs> when people like start adopting it in the cloud, it actually drives like front end and desktop adoption. And so be, because we're um, a general platform and because we've done so much work to be good in all of these different areas, um, that's what's driving this you know, final adoption. And the interesting thing about this to me isn't that you know, it lowers the cost of building an application or that it's good for businesses or any of that. It's that Node has this history from the web of being very easy to use and, and amateurizing the spaces that it's in. So when we you know, are supported in an IoT platform, we actually make it easier for people to program that IoT platform. And we make that IoT platform accessible to an entire generation of developers that wouldn't have been able to get involved before. Um, so that's really exciting, and that's Node Everywhere. And that's my talk, and so thank you.